Hey friends, welcome to episode 488 of the My One Two Three Cents podcast. I am Kevin Huntsperger. Joining me from the West Coast once again, Chad Smart. It's been a couple weeks. Chad, welcome back to the mix. And I got to ask you, have you voted yet in the opening round of the Enhancement Talent Tournament going on on the My One Two Three Cents Facebook group? group. I, I was going to say... I was going to say first, it's not the West Coast today. It's the wet coast. Mm. So we are under rain, more rain today. I think we're turning into the Seattle of California oh, wow. this year. Um, have I voted? I have not voted, but I have um, questioned some of the voting by our fearless leader, Greg Mahachko, and have messaged him to say, how could you not pick Iron Mike Sharp, who should be the runaway victor? Not trying to... You know, influence anybody's vote, but I mean, come on, it's Iron Mike Sharp. The guy needs his own. The do the major po podcasts have a big rubber buddy, baby bumper of Iron Mike Sharp, Sharp yet? Not yet, but I, I I hear it could be in the works. So, is, is there a line of jobber action figures? Because I think maybe that's what you and I need to start up. You know, the closest. I'm I'm glad you said that because the closest you get to it, and I'm. Is SD Jones? For those listening, yeah, I've, I've gone to the uh, cabinet behind me and pulled out my SD Jones action figure, which back in the day, this was a baffling choice. <laughs> There's also Outback Jack, Ted RCD, and uh, Corp Corporal Kirshner, who all ended up becoming enhancement talent. But SD Jones was always enhancement. I was kind of mm -hmm. surprised, actually, since we're on an SD Jones kick right now. Mm -hmm. um, he was the inductor for Tony Atlas at the Hall mm -hmm. of Fame ceremony uh, back in Chicago mm -hmm. at WrestleMania 22. I thought that was an interesting choice. But, uh, yeah, I love S.C. Yeah. Jones. I actually – and I am going to influence people. I hope S.C. Mm -hmm. Jones wins this whole thing. So, well, well, you know, I think you needed some jobbers for your action figures. You know, you can't have just WrestleMania quality matches all every time you're, you're playing That's with true. your dolls. Yeah. That's true. <laughs> playing with my dolls. Uh, so yeah, th this is a reminder. Uh, round one uh, will have closed by the time you're listening to this, but I encourage you to vote in round two. And again, I've never done a tournament like this before. It was just kind of a harebrained idea. I know my friend Brian Barnett does a tournament for uh, 80s movies. He and his wife are doing that right now. And they have a nice setup with it and everything. On, and so uh, if I could ever get proficient enough to replicate something like that for next year's uh, NCAA tournament, uh, kind of spoofing that with something wrestling related, uh, we'll work on that. But uh, in the meantime, go and vote. Join the My123Cents Facebook group. It is a private group because there were spammers in there. And so I've kind of kicked all of those folks out. And uh, we just have legitimate wrestling fans in there now and you can come in and promote if you're an indie wrestler if you have a podcast if you have a blog if you have a youtube channel come in and promote and and have fun and, and join the conversation so check that out uh and the the link is in the write-up for this week's podcast and every week's podcast for that matter uh we're on the road to wrestlemania still uh wrestlemania coming up in just a couple of weeks and and chad um where are you as far as the build-up for this year's wrestlemania i know that there have been critics of The Rock and, and Cody and and Roman Reigns. Uh, you know, some people critical of the fact that it's going to be The Rock and Roman Reigns in that tag match with Seth and Cody, and then Cody and, and Roman taking night two as well. Uh, kind of unprecedented the first time that uh, two wrestlers have main evented both nights of WrestleMania. So what are your thoughts so far as we are just a few weeks away? I mean, anyone that's been listening to the podcast knows that I am not a fan of the Cody Rhodes finish the story storyline. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking about that the other day. And I think part of it is when Cody was in WWE prior to leaving and, you know, going out on the indie tour and starting AEW, there is, to my knowledge, and, you know, correct me if you know if I'm wrong, but I don't think there's ever any talk about finishing the story or, you know, wanting to do hold the title that Dusty never held. And granted, Cody was much lower on the totem pole pecking order then. But for that to come back, for him to come back and that to be like the first story, it just, again, it just seems inauthentic. It doesn't, you know, it, it seems like they're trying to build something that isn't necessarily there, even though I get what the story is. It, right. just, it just seems forced. And after this last SmackDown, 
I I am even less interested in the Cody Roman match because these I don't know if you watch SmackDown every week, but these long 30 minute promo sessions where they just talk back and forth and nothing really happens. And it's just, it's, it's, there's no fire mm. in my opinion. It's especially for coming from Cody. It's just like, I'm, I'm going to beat you because I am Cody and I'm finishing my story. And Roman's just like, yeah, I don't care. I'm like, <laughs> fine. You know? And I, so in that regard, the main event of WrestleMania, I, I'm not feeling, you say, and you know, Seth, we've talked about it before. Seth Rollins feels like an afterthought. Mm-hmm. So if he's going to be challenging, you know, I, I don't know. But uh, other than that, the rest of the card, it should be decent. But again, after these two uh, two day WrestleManias, I just I'm still not. You know, this is our fourth two day WrestleMania, and I just I, I'm still not buying into it. It should be we'll one be day. Fifth, actually, this will be the fifth. Fifth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, because thirty six was two days. Um, but yeah, I'm just not, I, I think the idea of trying to cram everybody onto the WrestleMania card is, um, is too much. Not everyone, you know, it's, it's the participation trophy era of WrestleMania. Well, and that's actually, uh, that's a great segue into this week's topic. Cause we're talking about WrestleMania in the nineties, uh, the early nineties specifically, and kind of when WrestleMania stopped feeling like WrestleMania and when it maybe started feeling like WrestleMania, because I think that Hulk Hogan's influence on those those first nine WrestleManias mm-hmm. uh, set a pretty high standard for the event. And I want to get your opinion and your thoughts. And, and we um, have jotted down some, some numbers and notes and things that I uh, want to kind of dive deeper into because both of our fandoms started – pre-WrestleMania or right around the first WrestleMania in 1985. Mm-hmm. Is that fair to say for you, Chad? Yeah. I mean, my wrestling fandom started, I think in 84, my WWF fandom was like late 84. I think by the time I, I don't remember when WWF took over the wrestling at the chase time slot yeah. in KPLR, but you know, I know Hogan was already champion by the time I got into WWF. Okay. So yeah. So fair to say that, you know, our experiences with WrestleMania featured Hulk Hogan and Rowdy Roddy Piper and, uh, you know, the British Bulldogs, the Hart Foundation, these larger than life characters that it just seemed like, you know, and like you said earlier, we weren't getting, you know, uh, with the exception of WrestleMania and and a, maybe a match or two at WrestleMania 2, they were quote unquote WrestleMania quality matches. You weren't getting uh, you know, SD Jones and Steve Lombardi wrestling at a WrestleMania. You know, we were getting uh, Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat. We were getting uh, Roddy Piper and Adrian Adonis, Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, just for some quick reference, and I and I, I used the website uh, WrestleTalk to get this information. And, and since we're talking about the 90s, I wanted to go back to 1989 to kind of see where the standard was because by 89 – pay-per-view is on a regular basis. The first WrestleMania, uh, the first couple of WrestleManias, WrestleMania 1 wasn't even on pay-per-view. It was just a... Mm. a, uh, Closer, yeah. Yeah, like I said, that was the one that I watched because we had the giant satellite and we got the Madison Square Garden Network, which aired WrestleMania, so... Yeah. So it's a much different era in those first four or five WrestleManias. But by and WrestleMania, also, five, WrestleMania 1 was, you know, in the middle of the afternoon. It wasn't even a yeah. Sunday night thing. WrestleMania 5, up to that point, and for a, a while, actually, for a long while, uh, 767,000 uh, buys. And again, this is through WrestleTalk. That was in 1989. That main event was Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage. And that was yeah. that was up, up until... That record stood until... Uh, 10 years later at WrestleMania 15. And we're going to get to all of that and, and, and where we got and, and how we got there. Um, you know, for me, the Hogan Savage rivalry, the storyline, you know, you we're talking about Cody and, and doing his story. And, and this has been an ongoing thing. This is something that we haven't seen in a long time with WWE programming is that long storytelling arc. You know, I would argue that the Hogan Savage mega powers meltdown that happened in 1989 really got started in the uh, 
fall of 1987 when the mega powers formed and got started. And then, you know, you kind of weaved in Ted DiBiase and Andre the Giant and, uh, you know, all of these other characters. And, and you know, we've seen kind of a parallel with, with the bloodline and Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens and all these other characters kind of weaving in and out. And this one obviously has gone on much longer. Uh, but I, you know, I, I think that the Hogan Savage storyline was so compelling and so good. And, 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 you know, the main event where Andre beats Hogan for the belt. And, and I, I feel like that's all part of that same storyline. Um, and I, I wonder why, you know, because on paper, you would think Hogan and Andre, and again, this is the infancy of pay-per-view, so you would think that the Hogan-Andre match would be a bigger match than than Savage and Hogan. But, I again, this is where I think story plays such a big, important role, because Hogan-Andre only had about two and a half months of buildup before we get to WrestleMania five in, in 1989, where we had a year-plus buildup for Hogan and Savage. What do you think? No, I agree with you, because... I'm thinking back. I know WWE put out a documentary about WrestleMania three. I can't remember if it's, if it's on the D WrestleMania three DVD or if, and if it's on the network or not, but you know, I didn't even remember that they didn't start promoting WrestleMania three until I think like January of 87, yeah. you know, they were still, again, like you said, trying to figure out what WrestleMania is and, and WrestleMania three is probably, I mean, you have the first one, which is the debut. So that's going to be the big one. Two, I think they just tried to copy and be bigger than Starcade. Yeah. And I did realize that didn't work. And then three, yeah, you're trying to figure out what to do. And I agree with you. I think storytelling is a major part. And the Hogan Savage storyline, because it had been built up for a year. You know, Hogan Andre is big for the spectacle. Savage Hogan is big for story. And I'll just say WrestleMania 5 was the first pay-per-view that I ordered. Mm. And, and we didn't even have pay-per-view at the time. I had to go like at my aunt's house and another, you know, 50 miles away to get the pay-per-view because our cable system didn't offer it. But the reason we, I bought it was because Hogan and Savage. And, you know, I wanted to see Savage take down Hogan. Um, and I was a little upset when, when that didn't happen, but that's that story. And, you know, and I think it goes into what you were saying earlier, too, about big, larger than life characters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that is missing in today's wrestling world. Yeah. And so and, you know, somewhere along the way, too. They were dependent upon the main event or the matches, the supporting mm -hmm. matches to sell the card. And now and I don't know when that shift happened, but somewhere along the way, the brand, the WrestleMania brand became what everybody wanted in not, not I would say game. having gone back and watched all the WrestleManias over the last few years, uh, and this is gonna <laughs> segue a little bit. So we'll come we'll take the scenic sure. route and come back to yeah. our main topic in a minute. But WrestleMania 17 is really the first mania that I would consider to be what we know mania is today. Okay. Uh, with the large uh, stage setup, the you know the performances, the just the attitude. No pun intended, since it was the attitude era that was kind of kicking off at that time. Mm -hmm. But I would say after twenty two, when they started just doing football stadiums, yeah, that's when Mania really became. You know, and then that's when they added in the Hall of Fame, and you know, it became more than just one day it became the weekend and which we've seen now become the week of yeah. wrestlemania so and i think part of that comes with with steve austin and the rock leaving and i think that's when Vince McMahon really started to focus more on the brand than the superstar because yeah. he didn't want to build someone up and then if they left to scramble kind of like what he did after Hogan left, you know, it's yeah. like, who's going to fill the void now or, you know, after the rock and Austin, you know, Austin retires, semi retires, rock goes off to Hollywood. Well, you've just spent five years building these guys up. Now, what do you do? You know, if you're going to try to sell a major, major show and you don't have that, that star of player anymore. Right. Yeah. And that's exactly what we're going to talk more about as well, because 
a year later at WrestleMania six in 1990, which to me as a fan back then, and you know, I'm a high school kid uh, to me, even though it didn't have the story. And this is again, where I'm, I'm going to probably get annoying with saying it, I, where story really does count and matter. But to me, the bigger match, the more like Hulk Hogan and the ultimate warrior title for title, uh, you know, you think this is going to be a big match that's going to blow the roof off the place and, and they're going to have rematches and everything else, but only gets 560,000 buys comparing mm -hmm. that to the year before where it's 767,000. So a more than $200,000 drop in buys. And I, I'm curious to wonder what, what, what that was. And it feels like in that era, Hogan had already conquered, um, you know, all of his foes. He's he's beaten Mr. Perfect. He's beaten, you know, a few years earlier, beaten Andre the Giant. You know, it seemed like Hogan was unbeatable. So when you put guys like Rick Rude or Mr. Perfect or uh, any of the other heels, Ted DiBiase, the Macho King, there was nobody uh, on the heel side to face Hogan at WrestleMania. So I understand why they kind of pivoted and went with the Warrior because I feel like by that time, they had not done a great job of building up. You know, in the, in the mid 80s, it was big, larger than life guys like Andre the Giant and Big John Studd and King Kong Bundy that were going up against Hulk Hogan. But now in the in the late 80s, early 90s, he's been through all those. And now he's facing off against the guys that are more wrestlers. And, and it's kind of like the Roman Reigns thing with today you know they built roman reigns up so big that it's like how do you get someone to compare and get on his level and i felt like in 90 uh that was the case with hulk hogan and the ultimate warrior yeah i was just thinking that wrestlemania 6 was in canada so i was trying to think of the um conversion rate for buy rates into canadian from <laughs> us if that affects anything um but no i think part of it too you know Hogan was going to be leaving after WrestleMania six, you know, to go do, um, was it suburban commando or, I think so. you know, whatever movie. So I think to replace him, you want the ultimate warrior seemed like the logical choice. Cause he was the next bigger than life right. you know, persona and also a champion versus champion. We'd never seen it before at mania. Um, and, you know, and I think that's another factor in between modern WrestleMania versus, you know, the early days where, you know, WWF only had, you know, a couple hours of syndicated programming and primetime wrestling, which weren't focusing on start, you know, you talked, we talked earlier about the jobbers, you know, you're still getting jobber matches on TV. You weren't getting, you know, the matches that may end up at WrestleMania on regular television weeks or months prior before, um, but yeah, I think going with Hogan, and I don't remember the build up to when it started being Hogan versus Warrior. And I don't know if you have that in your in your records of it. I would, I would, I would say, I would say that it was uh, definitely around Royal Rumble time because they end up in the in the Royal in the Rumble, Rumble against each other uh, for for a second, and you kind of get that glimpse. And then they did the yeah. Saturday Night's main event that followed, where they teamed up against Mister Perfect and the Genius. So uh, they were they were yeah. dropping the seeds there. See, yeah, and uh, like you said, Hogan had gone through everyone. I don't think, you know, if you're trying to sell a major show, Hogan Warrior seemed like the like the logical choice because you couldn't do Savage again because right. you just, uh, you know, I mean, I guess you could, seeing how they like to do rematches now, but um, yeah, there really wasn't. You, you make a good point. There was no heel that was really on the level of Hogan by WrestleMania Six. Yeah. And then, you know, I would argue uh, and, and maybe probably not argue with you, but I, I think that I almost feel like Warrior was set up to fail, even though he conquered Hogan at WrestleMania. If you look at his defenses and, and the matches that he had in those six or eight months that he was champion, uh, there's a lot of teaming up with the Road Warriors against Demolition He's uh, in there teaming up with Kerry Von Erich from time to time. Uh, you know, he, he wrestles Rick Rude in the cage at, at SummerSlam. And, and then this is the era where we only have the big four. So there wasn't a lot of, of time to do other things with him. 
but I just feel like they kind of fumbled with him. And I wonder if, if 1990 would have been the time, because like you said, Hogan was leaving anyway. Uh, and this is still the era where they want the, the champion to be a baby face. If turning Hogan heel before WrestleMania and then giving the fans something to get behind, because even though Warrior was champion, you know, Hogan comes back at, and, and wrestles at SummerSlam. They, this is the mm -hmm. first time I think they used the term co-main event because it was Hogan and Earthquake and Savage and, or I'm sorry, Warrior and uh, uh, Rude uh, at SummerSlam. And then at Survivor Series that year, we do the ultimate Survivor Series match where Hogan and Warrior are the ultimate Survivor. You know what I mean? So there was mm -hmm. never, Warrior never had that chance to be in the spotlight. And it was kind of similar in... 88 with with Savage, you know, the first SummerSlam, the main event is Hogan and Savage teaming up Survivor Series. It's the same thing. Hogan and Savage are the last two in the ring standing victorious. Yeah. So obviously Hogan was the cash cow, but I also feel like he was at a point where he's getting burned out and they were not they being WWE was not doing anything or not doing enough, in my opinion, to prepare for that next torchbearer to run mm -hmm. and i feel like they've gotten caught that like that a few times uh, in later years like we said with austin and rock the john cena era you know we put all of our eggs into those uh so-called baskets and then it's like the fans you know how are we going to get behind the ultimate warrior if hogan is right there yeah. next to him? you know no, warrior never got that and i know warrior wasn't a great wrestler and he wasn't a great talker but he was something different than at the time and was something I think that a lot of the younger fans, and that was the base for a lot of it, could get behind. Yeah. And I wonder how much in the, you know, this is rumor and innuendo and speculation that we've seen on the internet for the last 30 years, but how much of that was also Hogan politicking to make sure that he wasn't replaced and that knew that he would be coming back and wanted to step back into, you know, that main event slot. I don't know. You know, I can only imagine that that's the case given Hogan's reputation with news media. Absolutely. And the drop continues at WrestleMania seven. And I feel like you have talked about this on, on a previous podcast that you had uh, with, with uh, uh, Mike DeKalb would one hit wonders, you know, 1991, 91 is kind of a, an odd year, I think in pop culture in general. And I don't know exactly what caused the shift or, and, you know, maybe it's because we were getting older. You know, I, I had turned 18. I was graduating high school, going off to college. My fandom never really changed. I don't feel like, uh, but by 1991, WrestleMania seven, we're down to 400,000 buys. And this is Sergeant Slaughter and Hulk Hogan in the main event. Slaughter's. The oh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I think you just were getting ready to hit the nail on the head. And, I, you know, this is also part of the problem, I think, with the Warriors' reign is, like you said, he was never he, – he, he was a placeholder, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I don't think, you know, when they put the title on Warrior that they had any plans to do Slaughter versus Hogan next year. But then with the events that were happening in the world, that became – uh, a story that they could latch on to and, you know, Hogan being the all American hero conquer, you know, it was like prox war by proxy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think anybody really bought slaughter at this point as world champion material. Yeah. And especially to have such a pro USA, you know, GI Joe character turn his back on America and just, I, I still think something's wrong with that story. You know, it would have been probably made more sense just to bring back Iron Sheik and have him be the Iraqi. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, he was there, but right, right. obviously way past his prime. And yeah. Ed Slaughter was also past his prime. Yeah. And so I don't, and I, you know, and I think also predictability, you know, when you go look back at Hogan Warrior, you know, you, I'm you're looking in hindsight, you know, Hogan's probably, if you knew that Hogan was leaving, that warrior was going to take over. But yeah. given Hogan's history, you never, you, you know, he could have became IC champion. Mm -hmm. But Hogan Slaughter, you know, the fans are going to be sent home happy, and it's right. going to be, you know, a very anticlimactic main event. Did that formula? Do you think, since we're talking about that too, did that formula hurt WrestleMania? Do you think, and is that attributable to some of these drops? The fact that the fans did 
always go home happy. That wasn't always the case with JCP and, and Starcade. Mm-hmm. You know, Ric Flair would cheat and win or we'd have a dusty finish or they would reverse the the win or whatever. But do you think that it was essential? Because we didn't really see I, – I don't count WrestleMania 9 because Hogan again, and we'll get to that in a few more minutes, but you know Hogan walks out as champion at the end of that one as well. It really wasn't until WrestleMania 16 that the first time a heel won – the main event of WrestleMania with Triple H beating the other three competitors, uh, mm-hmm. The Rock and and uh, Mick Foley and Big Show. So do you feel like, and again, this is us growing up, and I, I, I would be curious, if you were a fan in the early 90s, like that's when your fandom started, because, you know, obviously mm-hmm. Chad and I are reflecting and remembering, uh, I feel like the first 10 years of whatever your fandom was, whatever it's music, movies, whatever, that's where you're going to always resonate to and, and, and have those fonder memories of. So I'm curious of fans who started watching in this era, what your hindsight is 30 years later. But anyway, do you think that the heel or the baby face always had to prevail? What if Sergeant Slaughter had won at WrestleMania? I mean, I think Sergeant Slaughter wouldn't have been the right pick. I still would have rather seen Rick Rude beat the warrior for the belt and then face Hogan at, at Mania. But again, that would have been another, I think anyone that beat the warrior and was going to face Hogan at WrestleMania, it was inevitable that Hogan was going to win. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm trying to think back. I don't know if as a fan growing up, if I focused on the fact that the baby face always came out of WrestleMania winning, because, uh-huh. you know, we've said it before. We'll say it many times again on the show that it's all about the story. And if you can buy into the match and not, you know, if it's not completely obvious, if you have some suspension of disbelief that, hey, there's a chance Hogan's not going to win or, mm. you know. Um, I, well, no, I guess, yeah, Diesel was the face when he faced Shawn Michaels at WrestleMania 11. Um, but, yeah, if if you have sense that either person can win, I don't think it matters. Um and and it also depends on the follow up too, which, as we discussed with Warrior, there wasn't a good follow up to his winning. Yeah, and the the trend continues, and this is you know you know you and I kind of talked a little bit about this the other night when I was mm-hmm. explaining where I was wanting to go with this podcast, and and this is 1992, where to me one of my favorite memories to this day is the end of wrestling challenge when Bobby Heenan is holding the big gold belt in the summer of 91 and is talking about Ric Flair coming to the WWF. I loved Ric Flair in WCW and JCP. And the fact that he was coming to the WWF was exciting to me. And uh, one of the first house shows I went to, or the first house show I went to in college, uh, you know, Flair was in the main event. He wrestled Rowdy Roddy Piper at. And so I was stoked to see that he was there. I was stoked that he won the Royal Rumble and and became the WWF champion. Uh, And so it seemed inevitable. It's going to be Hogan and Flair. This is a dream match, or it seemed like a dream match for those of us who were reading the Aftermags back in the day and wondering, you know, Hulk Hogan versus Ric Flair, what will this look like? Who will win? But there were so many, and I think to this day, people fans would argue that this is probably one of WrestleMania's biggest blunders is that we never got Hogan and Flair at a WrestleMania. And I told you on the phone the other night, this is why I think it didn't happen. Hogan was leaving again. Uh, and they, and the buildup for this WrestleMania was, is this going to be Hulk Hogan's retirement? And they kind of hinted at it, but never came right out and said it. I could remember him doing the interview with Vince McMahon on primetime wrestling. He's now going to face off against Sid. And I can't remember how they, switch the story but it was going to be hogan and sav or hogan and 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 flair but then eventually we get to hogan and sid and savage and flair and this is the first time i think they co-branded a main event for wrestlemania uh we talked about it with SummerSlam a little earlier this is the first year though that they're and and it's the first year that the heavyweight champion goes on in the middle of the card and not in the closing match uh again i feel like this is another situation where It was too late. It was, you know, Hogan and Flair would have been great in 88, 89, 90. But by 92, the bloom is off the rose. Hogan's leaving. So you're not going to have him win the championship from Flair. Would it have been better to have Flair go into the 
WrestleMania as the challenger and beat Hogan for the title or doing what we did and putting the belt back on Savage. And I think by 92, Savage had spent some time in retirement, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. I felt like the, I don't know, things were getting stale maybe. I I, I can't really put my finger on it, but I I was not as excited as I thought I would be with WrestleMania Mm -hmm. 8 in 1992. As a non-Hulkamaniac, I'm going to say that the lackluster um, feeling was because you knew Flair was going to have to job out to Hogan and Mm -hmm. um, no one wants to see that. Um, which is why I think when Hogan came to WCW, you know, his first month there set the tone for the downfall of WCW already. That's me being sarcastic and cynical and <laughs> again, a non hulkamaniac Yeah. You know, I was, I was looking the other night and I didn't really come up with a good timeline, but this is also around the time that the steroid trial is starting to pick up steam yeah and so i i think that's also why hogan was stepping away you know i think he was going to do more bad movies but it was also to get him out of the limelight get him because you know when he comes back especially when he comes into wcw he's a good 30 40 pounds leaner oh yeah Um, shockingly you know um and so i don't know (sighs) If, you know, Vince's attention is more about, okay, how am I going to protect myself in this upcoming trial and not, you know, leaving the booking to, I think Jerry Jarrett was on the booking committee at this time. Um, Or, you know, there are rumors that Hogan and Flair had wrestled on house shows and Vince wasn't happy with the matches. And again, you know, and I think part of that too is a, a, a clash of styles. Hogan, obviously the WWF style, Flair, the JCP, the more the wrestling. Hogan is sports entertainment. Flair is wrestling. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those styles don't always mesh well. So I think, and, and you know, I think looking back, maybe it's also too much hype. It's not going, you know, or too much anticipation won't live up to the hype. Basically, yeah. you know, everyone wants Flair and Hogan. It doesn't matter how good the match is, it's not going to be good enough. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Or, yeah, or, and also maybe you, you know, there are plans to do it further down the road. Instead of, you know, instead of giving you what you want now, you build it up a little bit more. I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, Flair leaves later or about a year later in in january of 93 because vince mcmahon is quote unquote going for a youth movement and flair is only 43 years old at the time maybe at that time probably not you know in the main event picture anymore it's time to cycle some new people in but you know flair went back to wcw and was instantly inserted into the world title picture there as well Mm -hmm. so it was probably a good move for him in terms of staying on top and, and being relevant and then to come back yeah. in, in 2001 and, and, and finish out his, or what we thought would be finishing out his career. Uh, but, you know, Flair had a hell of a run and, and, and stayed around much longer after that. But that WrestleMania, uh, at WrestleMania 8, that's the first WrestleMania to dip below 400,000, and that's at 390,000 buys. A year later, 93, and this is where things really kind of, to me, get interesting because seemingly – when we go into WrestleMania nine, Hulk Hogan is not in the world title picture. It is Bret Hart, who is now the heavyweight champion. He beat Ric Flair, the fall of 92. And so now he's facing off against a newcomer in Yokozuna, a big giant sumo style wrestler. Uh, That WrestleMania got 430,000 buys. So it bounces back up. I felt like, again, this is where WrestleMania starts to get that different feel. And I think it felt different for a number of reasons. One, Hogan's not being promoted as the main event. Uh, But also, it's the first WrestleMania to be held outdoors. Um, It's also the first WrestleMania where we don't have the voice of WrestleMania in Gorilla Monsoon. He's there as a host of sorts, but it's Jim Ross, it's Randy Savage, who won the world title a year earlier, and Bobby Heenan. I love all three of those guys. But to me, this is where WrestleMania really... 
I guess, starts the whole new rebranding process because it did not feel like WrestleMania. I remember this was one that my parents had ordered because I was in college. My parents ordered it on pay-per-view, recorded it on VHS, and then that next week we were meeting for Easter and they brought me the tape and I remember watching it uh, right away. But anyway, what say you? You know, Bret Hart is the champion and I think, you know, again, this is where a, a... devout Hulkamaniac for a long time, even though I wanted to see change, I don't know that I thought that Bret Hart was the change that I wanted. I still wanted Flair, quite honestly, and and it was gone. I mean, I think, and, you know, this is hindsight. I think the being at Caesar's Palace and the Roman theme um, of the show made it a little cartoony, yeah, hokey. Um, and I've, I've read, I don't know, but you know, with this one being at Caesar's palace, kind of like WrestleMania's four and five being at the Trump Plaza casinos that the fan, a majority of fans weren't necessarily wrestling fans. They were, you know, gamblers that the casinos would comp tickets to. Okay. And so, you know, I don't know if you have a, you know, a, a, how, you know, it's, it's kind of like the. Universal and Disney tapings that WCW yeah. and TNA would do. You know, it's sure. like if you're not getting wrestling fans there, are they really invested? Are they going to care? Right. Um, and yeah, and I think, like I said, it's just a changing time frame again, not only in wrestling, but as we said, in pop culture in general. And, you know, as you look at, you know, music and movies at this time, this is we're into the grunge era and, WrestleMania is very cartoony still. Yeah. And so it's not really meshing up with that younger, let's say teenage to early twenties demographic per se. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the drop actually to WrestleMania 10 is only about 10,000 buys. It's 420,000 buys in 1994 WrestleMania 10. To me, that's significant because one, it's the first WrestleMania without Hulk Hogan at all. You know, Hogan's main event, Hogan's part of the closing match of every WrestleMania up to this point, Um, whether he's interfering in the championship match with Randy Savage and again in the ring with that celebration, you know, Savage didn't have that opportunity to celebrate on his own. Um, WrestleMania eight, he and Sid closed the show, even though it's, uh, you know, Sid is Mm. not or it's not a championship match. But, you know, WrestleMania nine, he comes back and, and beats Yoko Zuna at the very end. So WrestleMania 10 is completely without Hulk Hogan, no Hulk Hogan at all. And you would think that, you know, Randy Savage, who was champion two years earlier, the year before, before that, he's he's doing commentary. This year, he's got a, a Falls Count Anywhere match with Crush. This is his last WrestleMania. This is his last uh, big hurrah with WWE. He stuck around a little bit longer, but he went back to commentary. And so it felt like those big stars of the 80s, you know, Piper's at WrestleMania 10, but he's a, a special guest referee. Uh, we don't have like those big stars from the first and we've seen in the subsequent years on the anniversaries, it's, it's a bit of a bigger celebration and we bring out Hogan and we bring out, you know, later years, rock and Austin and, and those kinds of characters. But WrestleMania 10 to me, didn't have that fanfare behind it. There was no, you know, Hogan's not officially with WCW yet, but there's no mention of him when we don't see him, we don't hear from him. Um, you know, Obviously, Razor Ramon and 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 Scott Hall steal the show with the ladder. Or I'm sorry, uh, Shawn Michaels, Michaels. Steal the show with the ladder match. But you get Yokozuna defending the title twice. That's an anomaly. That's something new and different. Uh, we get to see some of those stars of the '80s being a part of it with referees like Piper, Mr. Perfect. But again, it's just it 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 was different than even though it was back in Madison Square Garden in a familiar surrounding, but it didn't feel like the 10th anniversary or the 10 year show for, for WrestleMania to me. Yeah. And I think it goes, like we said, it's your, a new generation is coming up without being not necessarily ready. Because I mean, by this time, you know, Bret Hart's what a 15 year yeah. veteran, you know, it's not like he's a spring chicken and right. In there. right. But in terms of being promoted as the guy and 
you know, Razor Ramon, you know, Scott Hall again has bounced around AWA, WCW before coming. And, you know, it's so it, he's also experienced. Shawn Michaels has been there for, you know, has been wrestling for over a decade. It's just, yeah. but they're not. And, you know, it's the funny thing I think with wrestling is age and experience don't matter as much as exposure. Uh, right. And my, that mean, you know, it could be like, you know, like Batista was much older when mm-hmm. he was wrestling, but because he had a shorter time frame, and the same way with the rock, like the rock, I think still gets over other than being, you know, the most electrifying and the biggest movie star because his time actually in WWF was very short. Yeah. You know, um, so yeah, I think you just we're we're at a time where you have a changing of the guard. That's not it's not a bad thing. And uh, you know, as from a work rate perspective, the guys that are coming up are much better than the guys in the early days. But you mentioned earlier, story, um, you know, story plays an important part. Not to completely completely derail the conversation, but I think this is the WWE versus AEW story right now is. One focuses on story. One focuses on wrestling. Which one is better? Mm-hmm. And I think, and I think, if you're trying to sell something, that that story is going to be the one that is is going to win out. And there's really no, at this point, I don't think there was a lot of story in WWE. Yeah. Well, and you know, here's and this is where we transition to WrestleMania 11, and the drop continues even more so, 340 thousand. Um, and to, by this point, this is the lowest buy rate for WrestleMania. It's WrestleMania 11, 1995. WrestleMania 10, I think fans may have still been holding out hope that Hogan was going to return or be a part of it because he's not publicly said anything about going to WCW. He's doing Thunder in Paradise. There was no, I don't think there was any speculation at the time of WrestleMania. Now, a couple months later, sure, he's there mm-hmm. and beating Ric Flair. But by 11, he ain't coming back. And, you know, you've got... Diesel, Kevin Nash, uh, as the champion. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chad, didn't the main event of this show, wasn't it Lawrence Taylor and Bam Bam Bigelow, or did yes. Nash and Scott and uh, and Sean close out? No, it was it was the celebrity match. It, well, okay, that's, I, that's what I thought. And so, was Lawrence Taylor the right celebrity? I mean, obviously we see a big drop, but is this, is this part of, is this the card not doing what, fans were wanting or was this just a sign of the times again as we're talking you know we're we're yeah. knee deep in the steroid trial by this point or i guess the steroid trial is over but the residuals of that the fallout from that is is still happening and and again we don't have those the only callback to the first wrestlemania we have i think is is uh roddy piper again serving as a special guest referee with the bob backland bret hart match but there's no other real tie-ins, I don't think, and and I don't, rem- I didn't watch football. I don't watch football. I watch it a little bit now, but was oh, come Lord on, you're a Swifty. Yes, yes, of course. We'll throw back to that uh, Super Bowl episode, but <laughs> you know, was Lawrence Taylor was he still active in '95 when when this was all going down, or was he already retired from football? And was he? I guess what I'm getting at is. Was there a better celebrity if we, if we were leaning that way? You know, in 85 with Mr. T, to me it made sense because Mr. T was one of the biggest names on, on television and in the movies at that point. Um, that would you could legitimately see getting in the ring and wrestling. You know, Tom Cruise, I don't think, was going to step into the ring and, and be a legitimate, credible threat. Uh, but was Lawrence Taylor the best choice? And I know I'm asking you to think back 30 years or nearly 30 years. Um, yeah. And I, I'm looking, uh, looks like his career ended in 1993 was his okay. last season. So he's, so he's he, at that point. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't see him being able to wrestle. And if he was still under contract, um, because I don't think the giants would have wanted him, you know, to risk injury uh-huh. even in the off season. But I mean, I'm looking at the card for WrestleMania 11, you know, there's only seven matches on the show. Um, and there's none of these matches are, I mean, with the exception of possibly diesel versus Shawn Michaels, I don't think any of these matches are, you you know, especially now 30 years back, you're going to want to go back and rewatch. I mean, I mean, just 
for sake of argument, look, let's look at the card. Allied Powers, Lex Luger and British Bulldog against the Blue Brothers, Jacob and Eli. Does anybody, you know, on a scale of one to five, rate your interest in that match above a 0.5? Yeah. Um, Razor Ramon defeated Jeff Jarrett. At this point, you know, Jarrett, I don't think was over. Like, I think he was still coming into the Jeff Jarrett that we know today. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, uh, Undertaker versus, versus King Kong Bundy. You can uh, say like, oh, well, Bundy main event at WrestleMania 2, you know, nine years ago. But what had he done since then? You body know? slammed a midget and dropped an elbow on him. That's about well, it. Well, I mean, yeah, if you want to really pump, pump him up as being awesome. But, <laughs> I mean, um, Owen Hart and Yokozuna versus the Smoking Guns. You know, that again, I don't think the Smoking Guns, as great as Daddy Ass is, no one's really – no one talks about the smoking guns these days. Right. Bret yeah. Hart versus Bob Backlund. You know, I, again, for me being a fan who started with WWF after Hogan was champion, I didn't even know who Bob Backlund was when he came back. You know, it's, it's not like today where you can go back and watch older stuff mm-hmm. or they reference guy, you know, Bob Backlund had hadn't been mentioned on TV to my knowledge, you know, yeah. in that time frame, And then, yeah, the, Diesel and Sean and Taylor and Bam Bam, which, I mean, that main event is better than it had any right to be, but it's still not snooky. So, I mean, no one's going to go back in. And, and again, Lawrence Taylor, yeah, he was kind of big at the time, but how big, you know, was he to the, to the football audience? Was he big outside of the New York tri-state area? Right. You know? I mean, it seemed like a regional celebrity more so yeah. than, um, you know, how that then, was. Yeah. Then a, then a, um, I'm trying to think of major football stars today. And the only one I can come up with is Travis Kelsey, who I don't think is really a star. Um, but yeah. Well, the drop. So, speaking of it, real quick, I'm going to segue okay. and just ask you with um, WrestleMania being in Philadelphia. Jason Kelsey just yes. retiring. Yes. What, what what odds are you putting at when the Kelsey's showing up at Mania? Oh, I think it's it's inevitable. I I I will be surprised if Jason Kelsey is not part of WrestleMania in some capacity, whether it's a backstage segment or he comes out and you know tackles somebody or or whatever. I I think it's inevitable. What do you think? Uh, I I think they would be dumb not to at least even try to get him there. Yeah, and if he comes out and beats up Gronk, I would I will become a Jason Kelsey fan. So, yeah, I, I think when they uh, when I first became more aware of of Kelsey being from or playing for the Eagles, I, mm-hmm. when I announced that WrestleMania was going to be in Philadelphia, I told my wife, I said, Jason Kelsey will be a part of WrestleMania in some in some fashion. And I, and I do. I think that that is is going to happen. So we'll have to wait a couple weeks mm-hmm. and find out if we're right. Uh, something that did happen, 50,000 fewer people bought WrestleMania 12 in 1996. This is 290,000 buys. This is Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels in the Iron Man match. Uh, Kevin Nash in the Undertaker. Or I keep saying Kevin Nash. Diesel and <laughs> Undertaker. Um, you know, those were the, the two big matches. Piper and Goldust in the sh- street fight. Um and again, I feel like even though WrestleMania was not feeling like it was in the early days, to me, this was where I was starting to come back more into it. And and I did get this one. I did buy this one on pay-per-view mm-hmm. uh, and recorded it. Because <clears throat> I think I, I don't remember what the circumstances were. I don't remember if I watched it live or not. But anyway, I did, I did have this one uh, on tape and watched it. Um, but again, I, I, I feel like it still didn't have that, you know, that feel, but it, I was starting to get back into it. It was, it was a spectacle again. And I, and I don't know what it was about it, but, um, you know, what did, what did you think was, was were Sean and Brett, you know, who obviously became big, big rivals. They had wrestled many times before this, but this was the first time on this stage where Sean kind of gets anointed and we start another, new era of the new generation with Shawn Michaels as the champion. Again, a, a far cry from Hogan Savage Warrior, but in line with the Bret Hart kind of era of champions. Yeah, I think looking back and then thinking back, I think I was more excited for the return of Ultimate Warrior, which mm. 
should have learned right. I've never to get excited about a warrior return because it's not going to last very long. Yeah. I, I do not like Iron Man matches. So this is, in my opinion, the worst, dullest, most pointless main event in WrestleMania history. Mm-hmm. Um, because I don't want to sit there for an hour knowing that the match is going to go an hour. I can't get invested until the last right. five minutes. And then the fact that it went over time. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, so my personal bias, I think that hurt the buy race on this show because, you know, it's what a five card, a five I think, match card. I think it's like, five or six matches. Yeah. It's, five, the, six, yeah. it's the smallest card for sure. Yeah. And you know, that the last hour is going to be taken up by one match. Whereas, you know, if you watch an hour long match that just happens to be an hour long where you can be invested the entire time, it's completely different. But yeah, I was not a fan of WrestleMania 12 um, overall. Well, what do you think of 13? Was it lucky? No, it was not <laughs> in terms of buy rates. This is the lowest. It is at 237,000, and uh, that's a 67,000 uh, drop. 1997, this is, you know, the NWO era. This is the first WrestleMania in the NWO era. Uh, Nitro is firmly kicking Raw's ass uh, week in and week out. This is part of that 83 week streak. Uh, I feel like the whole debacle with the championship hurt this WrestleMania. Uh, if you believe the rumor in any window, it was supposed to be Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels in a rematch. Bret Hart claims he was supposed to win the title back. Sean loses a smile along the way. Steve Austin wins the Royal Rumble. They do that mm-hmm. fatal four-way match at the pay-per-view in between WrestleMania mm-hmm. and uh, and Royal Rumble. Long story short, Sid walks out as champion after a, the next night on Raw. He goes on to defend against The Undertaker. And, uh, again, this is kind of a weird time. You, you get the great match with Brett and, and Sean. I'm sorry, Brett and... <laughs> Steve Austin, Austin. where they do a double turn. Shawn Michaels is there on commentary, which is kind of weird. Um, But I feel like looking back now, obviously, I I don't think at the time I thought this, but looking back now, you can clearly see we are are writing a new story and a new way of presenting and and moving in a different direction uh, with the Attitude Era just looming around the corner. But I felt like with Austin bleeding, because we hadn't really seen a lot of blood mm-hmm. at WrestleMania, if we had seen it at all. It, maybe the part of that steel cage match with Hogan and Bundy, but beyond that, we didn't see a lot of blood and, and, and stuff, and and so we're getting a little bit of an attitude going out, or coming out of, of this WrestleMania, but what did you think? You know, was this... I, I, I guess I'm not surprised that it was such a, a poorly purchased WrestleMania, but this is also... I guess we're probably now a couple years into the, or maybe this is the full, first full year of of twelve pay per views in a year. So I, I wonder if that had any impact on WrestleMania buy rates as well, because we're not doing the big four anymore. We we've, we've got twelve pay per views, and and fans have to pick and choose what they're going to buy. Yeah, and again, this isn't a you know standout card, and it, and I think because we're on the verge of the attitude era starting. And, um, and I think, you know, like you said, you had the NWO, which was a more somewhat realistic storyline, whereas WWE was still trying to cater, I think to kids, you know, you had, you know, happy go lucky Rocky Maivia versus the Sultan, Uh, you know, in the show. And, and, you know, I actually think the whole storyline with the way Austin won the Royal Rumble and then the four-way, ma- fatal four-way, like, that to me was a good story. And especially getting us to Austin Bret Hart, which is probably one of the top 10 all-time WrestleMania matches. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Undertaker, Sid, does he, again, I think Sid was so in so much in and out of wrestling that he even though I was a huge fan of him as a kid, like he, he just didn't seem championship caliber. Right. And, um, but I think, I think this laid the groundwork for what WrestleMania was to become. Yeah. And it just, you know, you have to start somewhere and it seems weird to say that after 13 years you're starting, but uh, again, I think this is just 
more of that evolution. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it, it really exploded the next year in 1998. WrestleMania 14, 730,000. Uh, that is uh, over a uh, half million more than WrestleMania 13. Still not quite to WrestleMania 5's level, but it's damn close. Uh, and this is really, you know, Attitude Era. It, it is the, the dawning of Stone Cold Steve Austin. It's the anointment of him as the champion. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mike Tyson's involved here. Uh, I, I feel like this was a perfect storm. Everything was starting to line up. People will credit Tyson's involvement in it, and I, I do think that he does deserve credit because I do remember seeing uh, mainstream media coverage of this and and people were talking again about WrestleMania. You know, Mike Tyson was a controversial, polarizing figure in 96, 97, 98. Um, and so to, to, to bring him in, I don't know that that would have happened today. If, if someone who had been, uh, had served prison time for rape, I, I don't see that happening in, in 2024 WWE. Do you, uh, probably like on the heels of getting out of prison. Yeah. Um, you know, and that's where you can say, like, well, he's, he served his time. He paid his due. Mm-hmm. People deserve, you know, yeah, not to be punished for the rest of their life. Um, but in today's climate, I, I, even if they brought him in, I could see a lot of protest. I could see yeah. a lot of backlash. But I think, you know, the other another thing to look at here that I don't think would have played out well with today's, especially social media environment, is... This is where Austin wins the title. Almost a almost over a year and a half after coining Austin 316. Right. You know, it was a long time to get him. Whereas now, you know, if he hadn't won the title by Survivor Series, fans would have been like, oh, he's being buried. Let's move on to whatever's next. And right. I don't know if Austin, you know, if if he could have sustained, I mean, you know, for right now I look at LA Knight kind of in that way who was really popular and now I was kind of yeah cooled off and I don't know you know especially having the rock back and all the comparisons between LA Knight and the rock if that works but anyway but what I'm saying meaning is that the rock or Austin finally getting the title here Mm -hmm. after the buildup it didn't seem too little too late it seemed like it was actually the right path and you know and Sean leaving after this for, you know, a few months or a year, however long he was out, um, kind of helped. But, but yeah, this is the Attitude Era. This is a whole new ball game for WWE. Well, yeah, Sean didn't wrestle for another four years after this. He oh, this was after this. Okay, this was yeah. So he, I mean, he came back and did like the commissioner role and right. things like that. But he was he was done in the ring for for quite a few four, years. Yeah. Do you think, though, I mean, since you brought it up with, with Austin in the story then, is it comparable to the Cody story? Because how many people were pissed at the end of last year's WrestleMania when Cody didn't win and they said, oh, it's over, they're burying him, they're, you know, mis- mismanaging him, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but you're right. I think if if social media were a thing in 96, 97, when Austin didn't win the big belt, um I think there would have been a backlash, but I I think that WWE played the cards right back then. And and it may still be too early to tell if they're doing the right thing with Cody here, but I I see similarities in those two uh, events. Yeah. And I also think Austin being injured at SummerSlam 97 um, played a part too. And, you know, they didn't rush him to the title. They had him go through the Hart Foundation. So he had, you know, and I think maybe that's where the Cody story you know, if Cody was was going through the bloodline, and I, you know, because I don't think, I don't think he's fought Solo Sokoa or, you know, uh, the Usos. I can't remember if he's had matches with Jimmy um, or not. But uh, yeah, I, again, my feeling is the Cody story doesn't have a lot of of meat on the bone of the story to begin with. So uh, it, it seems more of a force story than. Whereas I think Austin was more organic and no one expected it to get over the way it did. Like, you know, cause Austin 316 was not a planned out yeah. promo spot. It was just something he came up with and the fans ran with it. 
I think, and I don't know for sure, but I think that Solo Sokoa and Cody have wrestled. I think they wrestled last year leading up to Mania, but I, I, I don't know that for sure. Uh, but let's close out the 90s with WrestleMania 15, biggest WrestleMania to, to date in, in that time period, 800,000 buys. Uh, we are way, way into the Attitude Era. Raw has beaten the, the 83-week streak and is beating Nitro pretty consistently by this point. Uh, it's Rock Austin. It's the the feud that kind of set the path for the next several years. Uh, and I remember, you know, I, I'm in my early to mid-20s by this point, and, and uh, I am buying the pay-per-views. I, I, I bought WrestleMania 14 on pay-per-view. Uh, WrestleMania 15, I did watch it at a co-worker's house who had the device that got it for free. I think the statute of limitations has passed on that. <laughs> say that now. But yeah, I remember this was a this was a time when my friends that I grew up with watched wrestling and then they mm-hmm. got away from it. And by this time, they're calling, they're, you know, this is back before social media or texting, but they're emailing and and when I do run into them cuz I had moved away and was living 6 hours away at this point, but when I would talk to them, they were talking about wrestling again. And and I think that Austin and and Rock and Vince McMahon and, and, you know, on the other channel, Goldberg and Hulk Hollywood, Hulk Hogan, the NWO, it got people talking about wrestling again, who had moved away from it and stopped watching it uh, in those, in that lean and mean time of the early night and mid nineties. So uh, it really comes full circle, I think by the end of the decade. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously attitude era, it's now considered one of the, you know, best eras of wrestling. I would disagree. I think, there are just a lot of right parts at the right time moving in, you know, because um, you had WWE, you had WCW, you had ECW, which I think influenced WCW and ultimately sure. WWE, which um, ha- without that, you know, I think we would still have been having the Sultan versus the smoking guns at WrestleMania instead of a, um, you know, more, which I granted, I know Rikishi showed up and, um, the smoking guns were there for a long time and badass Billy Gunn. But my point being that they just, I, it's a whole different look and a whole different feel and a more, um, I don't want to say grown up mm-hmm. WrestleMania, but more it wasn't catering. It wasn't catering to kids. It right. Was, exactly. Cause we, we close out or we, we, we end WrestleMania six in 1990 start of the decade with Hulk Hogan and the Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. Lots of bright colors, neon, uh, you know, cartoons and 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 cereals and and mm. action figures and backpacks and stuffed animals and all that. And then we end it in 1999 with Stone Cold Steve Austin and The Rock. They wear black, they swear, t- they drink beer, they flip the bird, they beat up the boss. So it, it is a definitely a different vibe. You know, we're, we're telling people to eat their vitamins and say their prayers in 1990 versus, you know, telling Shine, taking something, shining it real nice and yeah. turning it sideways and showing it up your candy ass. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it's definitely a different attitude, you know, pun intended with all of that. So I, I guess to say all this, we, you know, the, the topic was WrestleMania of the 90s. Where in your fandom do you put this era of wrestling? I know we kind of transitioned from still the golden era in the early part of the decade to yeah. the new gen to the start of the attitude era. I mean, to me, it was a fun time and, and I get nostalgic looking back on it. And I feel like 30 years from now, I probably won't be here. But if I am and, and look back <laughs> on wrestling right now in this time capsule, what will my viewpoint be? I, I often wonder. But I, I think that this era. Uh, it holds up in some regards, but you know, it was also a time of transition and a time where they're mm-hmm. trying new things. And I applaud them for at least doing that and looking at alternatives to Hulkamania. Some of them failed, some of them worked. Uh, but I, I think they struck that lightning in a bottle, obviously in, in 97 with the start of the attitude era with, with Steve Austin. And that's where I, I argue and put Steve Austin right up there alongside Hulk Hogan, as far as, he didn't have the longevity like we talked about earlier, but I do think the influence was felt for many years to come, even to this day. Yeah. And there's a negative to that where I can say like the fact that we can't necessarily move on from 
the Austin there, you know, whenever he comes back, it has to be, yeah. he is Supreme wrestler. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you know, I think the nineties as a whole, were just, you know, it, I, it's weird because on one hand, I think they're the last great decade as far as when it comes to like movies and music and television. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, like you said, we were growing up, these were our college years into early adulthood, um, you know, being on our own mm-hmm. and um, you know, so it's obviously I look back with fun. I, you know, thinking back, I don't think I'd watched a WrestleMania live until WrestleMania 14 after WrestleMania five until 14, you know, I either had to wait for the VHSs to, um, you know, come out to the local video store, which used to be a thing, or, um, you know, someone would tape it and then you'd watch it later. Um, but, and I think also towards the end, you know, I think it was like 95, 96 when the internet started became a thing and you started looking at the dirt sheets that were online or, um, which added a whole new dimension to wrestling because I know you're a big fan of the after mags. I, mm-hmm. I read them a little bit, skip, but I never, you know, I never knew who Dave Metzler, Metzler was until the internet came around. I didn't know about the torch. I didn't know. I, and, and in one regard, you know, I think life was better back then, but mm-hmm. on the other hand, um, it, it is what it is today. Um, I just think that this era of wrestling, the nineties were, especially when you get, into the later half of the nineties. Um, it, it reinvigorated the wrestling fandom. And I don't know, you know, you and I have talked, we have the sickness, uh, which is being a wrestling fan that it doesn't matter if it's popular or not, we're still going to watch, you know, we're still mm-hmm. going to support. Um, whereas, you know, you look at a lot of the fans that came out of the attitude era that, as soon as it was over, so was their fandom. Sure. So, yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, I think that would be an interesting, if we go WrestleMania through the two thousands and look at that and see how things, you know, translated once that, once the ruthless aggression era started or when WCW, you know, when it became just WWE yeah. by itself. Well, um, let's do that next week. We'll, we'll take a look at WrestleMania <laughs> in the two thousands. This is when All we right. start going to WrestleMania as well. Yeah. So. Uh, we'll do a deeper dive into that and, and share some stories from our experiences and, and whatnot as well. Friends, we want to hear from you as well. Let us know what is on your mind when it comes to WrestleMania. It is WrestleMania season. We're going to carry on and continue this tradition for the next couple of weeks. And once again, thank you all for listening and or watching. Don't forget to subscribe, leave a review. And of course, go vote in the My123Cents Facebook group. It is the Enhancement Talent Madness Tournament happening right now. Have a great week, everyone.